question. Okay. The reason the following is not a question on your farm, but in the farm bill. So with your, with your clickers in your scotch, you just need one, two, three, or four for A, B, C, and D. Pretty straightforward. I think you can handle it.
when the farm bills were originally proposed in the 40s, they were called the Agriculture Act, when 50% or 40% of the population was working in agriculture. Today, a couple of million people work directly in the agriculture sector. And so you see that transformation from the Agricultural Act of 1948 to the Food and Agricultural Act of 1965 to the Food, Agriculture, Conservation, and Trade Act of 1990 to the Food, Conservation, and Energy Act of 2008, which has nothing about the farms in it. And there's a reason for that. Because, as you saw, the components, there are three basic components to farm policy, as we call it, or agricultural policy, or the USDA, <coughs> is that there's production, farm security, and rural America, that's one area. It's a relatively a small area of the policy. There's environment, particularly as it pertains to agriculture, uh, in the form of the Conservation Reserve Program, the Wetland Reserves Program, and the Grassland Reserve Programs, all intended perhaps not to directly protect wildlife, but indirectly do a very good job doing that. Um, and then third, and probably most importantly, in the modern farm bill, really dating back to the 60s, is the important role of nutrition, food policy, food education, and nutritional support. So three parts, production and farm security, the environment, and nutrition. And while the first one comes first, because that's historically a part of the bill, really as an important policy has not been seen as that important either by economists or from policymakers' perspectives. When we look at current expenditures of the Farm Bill, in, or farm expenditures, or agricultural expenditures, the farm of agriculture, in fiscal year 13, the expenditures would be 156 billion. Until this week, I've got to double check now that we've had a compromise, um, the sequester would have led to total expenditures in FY14 of 146 billion, so a small decline, but it, still a significant amount of dollars. As we look at the budget, 73% are going towards food and nutrition programs, 10, 14% is going towards the environment, and 10 or 15% is going towards, uh, towards farm programs. And so again, it's a food bill. I mean, that's the, the food bill and the environment is a secondary issue, and then really agriculture is a tertiary issue. The real political debate, which I think we'll be talking about later, and it was addressed in that question, is this current movement to decouple the food part of the bill from the agriculture part of the bill, which reflects a 50-year compromise between rural states and urban states. The reason why you have the two components in the bill is because of the two parties, or the, not two parties, but different interest groups agreeing to support one another's policies. And that's the only way farmers were able to get the subsidies, and it was the way that low-income households and families were able to get food and nutrition support. And that's what we see in the current debate is trying to go back on a 50-year compromise uh, that's existed. I will conclude with a little piece which tell you a little connection between the McCarthy, Eugene McCarthy, and farm policy. Um, and this, some of this is a bit apocryphal, but as you, you all know, uh, or you may or may not know, when they uh, had a, the break in the, elector, in the election in 68, when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, Eugene McCarthy came to campus, and an interesting piece of the story is he sat down with uh, renowned campus economist father Martin Sherber, and uh, they had a knockdown, drag out fight over agricultural subsidies. Because economists have generally opposed agricultural subsidies on the basis that it's an unnecessary distribution of wealth to other, otherwise relatively wealthy individuals, or increasingly that's been true. I think in 68 that wasn't as true. But of course, Eugene McCarthy was running for president. You can't believe that and run for president. They, you don't need agricultural policy. So they had a long debate. And so we're continuing that debate today. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Whitney, for that. It was, I, I, was, I felt like it was, I was watching Chris Berman try to run through like the, his, one, his fastest three minutes or whatever, and when, he, when he's giving all the highlights, but I really appreciate that. And then if you could just pass your clickers to the left, 
Uh, that'd be great. If you're at the table, let's all pass into that corner. Um, then we're just going to overwhelm that. Corner. We'll pick them up again. Thank you. Go ahead, Katie. Farm bill that currently 
uh, is in place in 2021. Um, there are only two references to climate change in the entire bill. Um, and that is allocating a research fund specifically for climate change, but that is a lot of pages and a little reference, um, as opposed to the New European Union um, agricultural bill, which puts a huge priority on climate change in Australia as well. So those are my three areas that I want to touch on. And I'll pass over to Lucas and Denny to talk more about environmental implications. Hi, so um, the environmental and conservation issues that are um, sort of embedded in the Farm Bill um, are kind of squished between these two sides, one being the nutrition and the other being the, uh, um, the agricultural pieces. And conservation is uh, inextricably linked because of the great impact that uh, the agricultural, agricultural impact or uh, agricultural industry has on the environment. Um, large um, industrial farms, the agribusiness, which has developed in the last 100 years, has uh, great environmental impacts. Um, they are uh, account for about one third of our greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. They have impacts on our soil. They are using about 80 percent of um, all water in the United States, or account for 80 percent of consumption in the United States. Um, so that is a whole other sort of talk about the sustainability of our agricultural in industry. Um, but within the Farm Bill, um, there are a number of elements that address um, conservation issues. Um, in the bill, they have set their, in the past, they have uh, allocated money for different programs like the Conservation Reserve Program and the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which are give financial incentives for uh, farmers to practice sustainable um, farming techniques, um, things like conserving water or limiting pollution or having a clear and uh, an organic farm. Um, and I think Jenny can talk more on why uh, conservation is so important in the United States and how elements of the school effect. Hello? I've never used one of these before. <laughs> so the, the conservation part of the farm will actually be such a small percentage of the portion of the money that actually goes to uh, the, the agricultural industry and the farmers. And, um, but in 2008, when the farm was passed, it allocated about $24 billion to the actual conservation of wetlands and grasslands that different farmers use. And uh, part of that sustainability thing that uh, Lucas had mentioned is just that, um, for example, some people uh, receive money for not actually using farmland uh, for farming that way. Uh, it doesn't cause like, soil erosion later on in the future. Um, but um, because of Congress's ability to pass a new farm bill uh, last year in 2012 in September, uh, all throughout 2013, we had no, well, um, the agricultural science had no money that was actually allocated um, towards conservation programs, uh, which meant that throughout the whole year, um, there's really no reason for farmers to um, go to the efforts of the conservation come out of their own personal means. They are not actually getting um, reimbursement the efforts. And then also, um, the, the House and the Senate have both been trying uh, to pass new farm bills, um, like the Senate's Agricultural Reform uh, Food and Jobs Act, um, which if either the House or the Senate would pass either version, uh, it would deduct the allocation of money by three and a half to five billion dollars. Um, and on top of that, uh, it also remove the regulations that would keep um, the farmers uh, actually going to the efforts um, of conservation. Um, so that means that they would be receiving the money, 
uh, for conservation purposes, we're going to actually have to do anything with that. Um, then, then, I guess, uh, something else just to mention is that um, so the Farm Bill is also meant to protect um, these wetlands and grasslands, not only for the farming, um, but um, for the, I guess, preservation of the land. For example, uh, in the United States, um, the wetlands and grasslands we have for the farmlands, which are privately owned, uh, actually make up the nesting grounds of about half of North American species of birds. And so as the wetlands and grasslands are destroyed or used by farming, uh, then those species of birds have less area to actually uh, have the nesting grounds and small habitat and then that can eventually leads to uh, the extinction of the forest. And then there's also the water pollution that occurs from uh, the farm farming uh, that's going on. And um, water pollution from farming is actually not uh, addressed in the um, uh, Clean Water Act. And so it's the farm bill's responsibility to, uh, to address this. All right, well, since you met these, these gentlemen talked about conservation, that's maybe the first thing I want to hit. Um, I'm probably, I was asked to be here because I've had direct experience with the farm bill. My family farm, uh, my parents own about 600 acres in southern Minnesota, as well as raised about 10,000 hogs. And uh, between my grandparents and my parents, we also have about 200 acres in the Conservation Reserve Program, as these guys mentioned. And what that is, is where uh, basically the federal government in an interest to preserve uh, wetlands, grasslands, natural habitat in your area, basically rents their land from you and says, you can you own land, you own the title of the land, but we own the rights to keep this land in um, its natural state, restore it back to its natural state for some programs. Uh, CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, is a tenure contract. And uh, the <coughs> Wetlands Reserve Program is a uh, is a lifetime thing. So forever, you lock into a contract forever. And whoever buys that, they guarantee they're guaranteed a paycheck, but not a but they can't ever till it up and put it back in an agricultural production. Um, and we've done that for a myriad of reasons. We have a lot of uh, like you mentioned um, around wetlands. We have uh, Minnesota state law allows up to 60 feet uh, along drainage ditches. Um, which acts as a natural filter, not only for um, things like pesticides and fertilizers that are applied, but also for dirt. Um, a non-barrier dish needs to be dredged out of the dirt that's at least the bottom over 10 years. When you have a 60 to 120 foot strip of grassland around it, that stretches that out to 75 years because the grass, the first few feet of that grass catches all that dirt. Um, so that's that's one thing we can discuss a little later. I guess, and the biggest thing too that maybe didn't get mentioned before some of the history is the first farm bill, basically um, the government was working to buy up um, extra supply in the marketplace. So they bought up milk products, grain products, um, cheese, butter, all that stuff and stored it. And that's how the whole nutrition program started is that the government had these stores of powdered milk and butter and cheese and all that stuff and they turned around and they gave it to families whose incomes were low, things like that. My mom remembered back when she was a kid um, that, that coming to her local area and um, some family, families participating in that. And then, like Parker said, in the late 70s, it turned into more of the food stamp program where the government, instead of buying up the market, the government would pay the farmers either to produce or not to produce. And so that lasted until about the last decade when instead of paying the farmers, a lot of times they would pay farmers not to run ground, not to find corn or soybeans on the ground because there was too much supply. Up until about 10 years ago, we grew five billion bushels of corn or so a year, and we used it all in a year. And there was a year's supply in the bin, in the elevators in the country before that. So there was an excess of supply, so the government would pay the farmers to not grow their products. And then about a decade ago, when ethanol started becoming big, all of a sudden, the government realized, hey, instead of paying the farmers not to grow it, we can pay the farmers to put it in their gas tanks instead. And so that's really been the rise of the ethanol. Um, and you know, whether for good or for bad, that's kind of been the evolution of the Farm Bill paying farmers. Um, and one thing I want to mention too, the Farm Bill for farmers, for agriculturalists, the, the biggest things are food, fiber, fuel, and forestry. Um, the Farm Bill regulates all of those industries livestock, uh, 
cash crop production, forestry, all of that. Um, and like, like these guys have said, it's about 30% of that entire bill is those four key areas. And while the U.S.'s participation, um, labor participation in agriculture has declined, it's still between 15 and 20% of our total labor force. So that's still millions and millions of people whose livelihoods, whose paychecks, whose families depend on that money. And, and in the next 50 years, world food demand is going to grow by 70%. And we're already, with things like, with corn especially, we're already sweeping out the bins at the end of the year now with ethanol. And so we need to figure out, and part of the Farm Bill is also for research for all these programs. Places like the University of Minnesota, universities all across the country do tons and tons of research to figure out, well, how are we going to feed 70% more when we're already really pushing the limits of what our, you know, hunt, couple of million <coughs> acres here in the U.S. can provide. We've got pretty much every tillable acre that we can get. And they bounce back and forth between CRP and stuff, but that's still a very small per, uh, percentage. Um, and I think those are kind of the few things I want to touch on, and I'm glad to answer any questions anybody has on me or anything else. Thank you very much, everyone. I think we had an awesome panel and an awesome uh, professor uh, just uh, give us a quick overview of a really complicated piece of legislation. So let's give them a hand before we do. Thank you very much, everyone. I really, really appreciated that. Um, and before before I continue, I do want to say, before I do questions, I do want to say that there will be uh, prizes for people who ask questions today. We're going to give out some of these McCarthy Center t-shirts, which uh, my colleague, Justin Martin, has spoken. Yeah, ooh. It's, uh, they're pretty, pretty great. Um, also, I think there might be some, some calendars as well. There, there, anyways, there's, some, there's some, some goodies if you ask good questions. So. Um, I encourage you all to, to do so. And, and if you don't have a question, just comments, uh, whatever, honestly. It's a very informal uh, setting, an informal dialogue, like I was saying. So, do we have any questions right now? <coughs> all right, I got a question for you. So, you talked a little bit about ethanol, but you got really editorial and I kind of wanted to hear your answer. So, uh, what do you think about ethanol? Do you think it's a good program, bad program? The corn farmer in me loves ethanol, and the hog farmer in me hates ethanol. Uh, how is that? So, so what ethanol has done is it's driven up demand for corn. And, uh, you know, people talk about wealthy farmers, all this stuff, and that's really been in the last decade when the prices have skyrocketed because demand has been so high. But now that uh, last year corn prices were about seven, bonds between about $6, six dollars six fifty and seven seventy five a bushel in uh, 2012, fall 2012. And then all of a sudden, this year corn prices kind of kind of slumped down a little bit. And uh, this fall, most of uh, my dad's corn was sold between about 450 and five. Some of you had it sold, but that gets into the crop commodities markets, and that's way above any of um, And so I, I guess it's it's a good thing in that we're using our acreage, but it's a bad thing that I guess we're mandating that people have to use it in cars, and especially new push to 15% ethanol. And I know the manufacturers, automobile manufacturers haven't really gotten to the point where they're comfortable doing that. Um, and especially on older vehicles, um, it can hurt you know, parts, parts of the fuel systems and engines, and they won't warranty that and that kind of stuff. And it just, it's really a mixed bag, and it's good for agriculture, it's good for commodities prices, it's good for crop farmers, but it also hurts the feed, feed markets and feed supply. And now that corn's cheaper, um, it's become better. And really, the crop, the crop and livestock markets are inverse. So when crop markets are down, livestock markets are up. When crop markets are up, livestock markets are down. So they kind of um, bounce back and forth off of each other. So it's just interesting to watch that and to see how this has really affected um, less so the actual production agriculture, but more so the agribusiness, the, the business management, farm management, how you diversify your portfolio and kind of manage how you, what you're planting, what you're, what, what the farmer's doing. Can I add on what I was saying too? Um, well, well, we'll pass this over to you. I just wanted to add on that I, I totally see that, that paradox where um, it, to elaborate, just not good for feed, but also for human feed. I mean, we're using an edible crop, 
for fuel. And of course, I'm all in favor of alternative uh, energy sources and things like that, but I believe that there needs to be much more research into what other crops we can be used that aren't taken away from a means staple in uh, ordinary people's diets. That's a good point. Um, uh, like I mentioned, there's about 13 billion bushels. About half of that goes into ethanol production. About 4 billion bushels, give or take, so that puts us at about 9, goes into animal feed, chickens, hogs, turkeys, etc., uh, cattle. Um, and about 1.2 to 1.5 billion is used in food products, so I produce corn syrup for soda, soda and food products, um, ground cornmeal for tortillas, corn chips, cornbread, all that kind of stuff. And so it hasn't really affected the supply, but it's affected the price. And Parker can elaborate a little more on that as well. <laughs> just, just two little comments. Uh, there is, I mean, there is a direct effect on the food costs around the world of our ethanol policy. So our ethanol policy is a great article from several years ago from Foreign Affairs called the Removable Feast, which ties uh, high food prices. <laughs> in developing countries to our ethanol policy. Because what it does is it, it takes land out of certain commodities or it, it extracts what would have been exported to other markets and maintains it in the U.S. market. The second piece is that one of the challenges, and uh, the environmental studies major might uh, be able to look this up, but there's been a good, good amount of research by economists and by uh, environmental scientists suggest that ethanol, in fact, has a, a zero net energy gain. And so it, it is directly, basically, a continuation of farm subsidies. It's just a farm subsidy in a different way that has, in many ways, many more negative effects than traditional farm subsidies. Well, I think ethanol like, is just a, a push for energy independence within the nation. Like, that is sort of the basis behind why there is a big net for that in some way. So uh, well, it's not like a complete uh, renewable, um, reliable source of energy, it's, there are other motives behind the market. All right, uh, Austin Egan had a question. He's just gonna talk really loud because we are really restricted with this microphone, so. All right, All right. Dr. Green, you just mentioned more of the international perspective, and that's where that's going to a bit more far I'm really, I'm really curious about the panel's perspective on the argument that subsidies, agricultural subsidies, do not allow U.S. farms and U.S. companies and U.S. You know, agricultural uh, production firms to compete on the international global stage. Can you kind of repeat the question a little bit? Um, basically, he's wondering, if the subsidies, if the government's kind of playing with the agricultural market affects our ability to play on the world stage? That's the question. And I haven't done any personal research into it, so I can't elaborate on that so much. I know the US is a net exporter of agricultural products, mostly because we grow, you know, everything we need here, we don't need to import um, from other countries, aside from, you know, specialties and things like that. And so I know, um, like I mentioned, um, that 13 billion, about 2 billion of that is exported all around the world. Lots of our meat products are exported around the world. Um, all kinds of products are exported. Um, I don't know, the interest in season, maybe these guys do know a little more, but I don't think, I don't think it hurts us, but I don't know if it necessarily helps us. Another part is that, uh, We do, we do have a long history in a lot of ways. I mean, there are a number of programs. The Foreign Agricultural Service is primarily charged, part of USDA is charged with promoting U.S. agriculture abroad. And our policies, because they subsidize our production, lead to more production and, and probably more exports than we might otherwise have or might otherwise need to have uh, historically. We also have some aid programs, the PL 480, Public Law 480, which is an aid pro a food aid program, which is was established uh, with the stated intent of providing 
uh, commodities to foreign countries, which those countries could then sell to raise money for their, so it was a form of giving aid. Uh, and that presumably was to help farmers. There's a lot of debate over whether that's a good policy. Um, but that those are there. So there are some clear programs that are intended to promote uh, agricultural exports, and they do strengthen us. Cotton is one of the areas where there's been a lot of criticism from many West African economies where our cotton policies have uh, promoted American cotton to the detriment of uh, countries which, in fact, could produce, that, uh, produce similar quality cotton at a lower cost. Um, so that's one area where you can see there's a positive effect for our farmers, but potentially a negative effect for some ex uh, international producers. And I think that that last point on cotton is the point that you were getting at, whereas um, U.S. agriculture is kind of artificially inflated in a way because of the extra subsidies that are given and the priority that U.S. crops are given on the world market. Um, and so whether that's good or bad thing, I'm not sure. We got a big question back there. Can you, can you talk loud? Sure. I'm wondering if the Farm Bill has any correlation or incentive toward um, local food for SNAP dependent uh, areas, and if it's working or doing any work toward education to food deserts or even transportation of local food to food deserts. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And I know that it's something that's really been promoted heavily for this new Farm Bill. I'm not sure what the status is on it, but I do know that there have been recent stipulations I believe, I don't know the exact details, but that um, people who are on food stamps can use that food stamp dollars at their local farmers markets. Um, in terms of transportation and things like that, I'm not sure. Do you guys know anything else? Um, yeah, there are like embedded within the larger, um, larger pieces of the farm bill, like smaller sort of like R&D type programs, um, kind of organic farming. Um, and What's R&D? Uh, research and development, okay. yes. Um, so I, yeah, I think, um, yeah, the, the SNAP programs that like, allow um, people in poverty to purchase organic food uh, are, are necessary, but a very minimal part of this. Thank you. And kind of going off, one, one more point is um, not necessarily promoting or organic necessarily <coughs> either, but healthier choices. I know there's been a lot of work by different um, organizations to push less subsidies on, on things like corn because it does uh, so much, like, like I was going to go into high fructose corn syrup and things like that, that generally are in foods that are nutritionally hurtful. We, got, we had a question in the back. Yeah. Going off of Austin's question, I was hoping the panelists could speak about how subsidies in the farm bill might be connected with uh, free trade agreements, particularly NAFTA and how these free trade agreements are generally harmful, particularly to Mexico and other countries in the region. Uh, so if you guys can speak to how our subsidies are affecting other countries. Can you speak on that? Not, not I, I can try. I, I, I can reiterate. It says, I mean, I, I can sort of reiterate. You know, the, 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 the section two dimensions, the second question of the ethanol policy is the one, is that uh, you know, historically the U.S. has been a major exporter of agricultural commodities, and, and that has been a policy because that's one of the, you know, one of our major exports that we want to promote American agriculture. We've got all this production, and so we've exported globally. We have the public, the PL480. Uh, interestingly, uh, this is where the ethanol policy, which has soaked up much of our excess production, has had the reverse effect, so that we export less <laughs> And this potentially has a negative effect on consumers in many markets which don't have adequate production. It's a very tricky balance. Um, there is some sense that uh, the global trade environment for, for agriculture is, is challenging because you're dealing with countries like Canada, which has its wheat board. You have the European Union, which has tight controls on agriculture. The, the parties that, and then you know, even Brazil, has had a long history of supporting its agriculture. Uh, for example, in the cane, sugar, ethanol, uh, they developed that in the 70s, 60s and 70s for their own reasons. And so we're in an environment where uh, there are many big players in the market that have very 
uh, do not promote free trade in their agricultural products, but there are many small parties, small countries, that are probably negatively affected, not just by U.S. agricultural policy, but by agricultural policy and all of the big players in the markets. So that's where I come to the countries like West Africa or small countries in the Caribbean which struggle with uh, uh, certain commodities. Um, so that we have a negative effect, but it's, it's in tandem with all the other big players in the market on these small producers. So I, I'd probably do that. Uh, uh, we, we got another question up here. I was going to hope that you guys could talk about how the farm bill relates to the immigration bill and how it might affect labor markets. And so on. I, I I see I see the points you're making, whereas uh, so many of our agricultural workers are are migrant workers. Is that kind of the tighter thing? I don't think there's anything explicitly stated in the bill, but I think it's very important to note that the large majority of our agricultural industry is made up of um, undocumented citizens. Yeah. <laughs> Edwin had a question too. Um, the question is, um, why is it called the Farm Bill, which is to say it has to do with uh, SNAP? Is that to try to get uh, the wider uh, support, and is it just to get across the Congress? My other question is, who really benefits from the Farm Bill? Does it, uh, a lot of things that are part of the Farm Bill helps small farmers. Is that really true when 75% of the larger uh, farmers are the ones who actually get this money? Um, we can start with uh, the name question. Um, it's called the Farm Bill colloquially, uh, but it's not the actual title of the actual bill. It's just um, what it's most commonly referred to as. So, uh, Dr. Whitley here has you know, you know, 15 different names that's been in the past. Currently, it's the Food Conservation and Energy Act of 2008, which is the technical term of the Farm Bill. Um, and then to go off who it actually helps, I mean, that was kind of the question I posed earlier with, you know, up to 80% of it going to people who aren't necessarily farmers. Um, it's a really good question. Why, why would it be globally referred to as the farm bill? Um, and in terms of large acre business as opposed to small farmers, can you talk about that? Okay. Um, basically, the, the government is working on a market-based approach, not on an individual approach. So things like direct payments, things like you know um, subsidies are basically on a per bushel produced, per acre run, things like that. Um, and the, the subsidies are a lot smaller proportion for a large farmer as they are for a small farmer. Like our family, direct payments, which you're looking at eliminating, I don't think many problems, many farmers will have a problem with that because it's like $2,500 on, you know, several hundreds of thousands of dollars of you know, corn produce. Um, but there's other programs, other, you know, it's basically designed to help the smaller farmers compete, but at the same time, the subsidies are just basically market-wide. They're not on an individual farmer basis. Uh, Dr. Whitley, you have I mean, with, uh, we had a politics standpoint talking about um, the government shutdown and how there was lack of communication about what to cut and was spending and stuff. How does, like, how does the farm bill reflect those, um, like, the mentality of trying to conserve as much, trying to cut the deficit, trying to sort I think most of that again happens in the, the SNAP. Um, and the two proposals that are out there right now, um, the House proposal, which obviously is mostly written by Republicans, uh, aims to cut $40 billion out of SNAP in 10 years. And you know, uh, I don't know the details of that. The Senate proposal aims to cut $4 billion out of 10 years, which you know, in the federal budget, $40 billion is around a year, basically. Um, so it's, it, it's hard to say, and I know definitely part of the U.S. policy is to promote our agriculture. Agriculture is still, dollar-wise, a huge business in the U.S. It takes up the most land, it takes up the most resources here in the U.S. because we have good agriculture, because we have good universities, because we have good farmers. Um, and so really, it, it is a priority. And so I think as part of the shutdown was more over 
things like defense, other entitlement spending, <coughs> Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all that stuff, versus the Farm Bill, which is six, what's what's the total dollar amount for the Farm Bill in 20, the current Farm Bill? It's 146 billion for FY14, it's budget. Okay, so. What, and what, yeah, so that's, again, a small percentage of the federal budget. So even if you cut a huge amount out of it, it'd be a small percentage of anything. I just might take a moment. I, I don't think it's around the Well, and the budget, and that doesn't, I, I, I see where you're coming from, and I definitely agree with that. It's around year when you compare it to the $1 trillion budget. I, I don't disagree with that, but I'm, I'm trying to get down and skip the people who are eating. And what it really aims to cut out is some of the abuse, some of the, you know, bad programs, some of the other things in there. It doesn't aim to cut out, they don't want to cut out poor families who are getting these, um, getting this money, getting these benefits they want, because they, they want need I, I haven't read it, so I can't, you know, go on a dot or three dot basis. But I know, you know, the aim isn't to leave families hungry. It's to help help make our budget and our our whole government a little more efficient, a little better utilized. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Excuse me. Do you believe that cutting the budget would help prevent corruption? Cutting the budget help prevent corruption. Like I mean, like what you're saying is like, you know what I mean, like. If we're to cut spending on it, would that cut for up um, on a the basis of our politicians or the basis of people? I'm saying like forty billion dollars in regards to four billion dollars. I, I think that's what it hopes to do. I don't know if that's what it will end up doing. And that's that's I think the sticking that's one of the big sticking points of the current two bills. And I'm not saying you know I I'm for one and against the other. I'm just you know talking about kind of the general. <laughs> kind, of, kind of to put numbers on it, uh, the $40 billion cut would be 3% of what goes to SNAP, um, what is being proposed by the House, and it would be 0.5% um, in the Senate. So it would be um, comparatively large from small, but I have to definitely agree with Professor PBJ's point that on um, family by family income, it would be a huge cut. We have a question. Bridget in the back. Great question, Bridget. I'll make sure I'm just going to talk about this. <laughs> this came up, I gave a talk on food day about the food food policy in the United States. So the, the question here really is ultimately this cut, the cuts in food stamps is a political question. Because the goal to decouple the farm bill from the food bill is a political choice. Not there's real no no other reason because what you're trying to do, what they're trying to do is they by decoupling it, one group is trying to claw away votes from food subsidies. Because if if they don't, you know, if, if they can pass the farm subsidies without the food, then they no longer have to have this this compromise between different parties. And so they can get what they want, and then they don't have to give anything in return. So there's a there's a political motivation there because in the past there's been a willingness on both sides to sort of make this compromise in the interest of the, the, the different constituents. So the, and the, the challenge with the cuts in food stamps is that's also a political move because it's, as it says, from an accounting perspective, it is a, a rounding error. But from a political perspective, if you're campaigning in Mississippi, which happens to be my home state, um, and you say you're cutting food stamps from the Cadillac welfare recipient, it sounds really good, even though it's not an accurate portrayal of the amount of fraud in the program. It turns out the amount of fraud in these programs are minuscule uh, by a large measure. From, a, from pure, I, just statistical analysis shows a small amount of fraud. So that's where it is. It's driven by politics. It's not driven by, I mean, it's, 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 it's not really a question of efficiency because it is such a small share of the budget. Uh, it's very hard to see it being a, a, a cost-saving perspective. It's, it's, it seems to be all political. 
that's just my point. So. And then um, something that, that I've been bringing lately too is that these cuts, it's not like they won't be spending the money, but the cuts and SNAP will be going to things like uh, new farm subsidies and expanded crop insurance. So it's not that the bills will be less expensive, it's just where they'll be allocating the money, which is also, you know, politically decisive, divisive as well. Because on the talk, she's bringing up the food policy. When we yeah, talked, she was at, she, she was asking about when she saw the talk earlier. There was a discussion of what are the long-term economic benefits of food programs. Because we can talk about the same similar sort of things about all these policy policies: environmental, agricultural, food. But there's clear evidence suggesting that at least some programs, like WIC, the Women, Entrance, and Children Program, the National School Lunch Program, are both going to improve nutrition among young households, among young families and thus improve their healthiness. And there is actual data to suggest that the Women in the Children Program, which is just a fraction of the size of the SNAP program, uh, has a, a basically, is it a $5 return for every $1 spent? Uh, because what you've done is you've improved the nutritional productivity of the worker over their life, and as a result, I, and you, you improve their ability to benefit from education because their brain develops better. Um, the evidence for SNAP is a little, more tenuous in terms of its direct and long-term impact because you're dealing with a broader population, but there is some evidence to suggest that it does improve some aspects of the nutritional quality of households. Not, not universally, but the primary thing it does is what's the policy supposed to do is it increases the caloric intake of the household, which presumably, if your goal is to make sure that people are adequately fed, that's you know that's successful. But there, there's a lot of research trying to look at how how is doing this now, how is that not, not even considering social justice issues, which are of course important, very important, but from a prudential perspective, there's a long-term payoff from investing in that now. So that, that's, there's been, like I said, there's been work on that. Like I said, that's on an acre by acre, a bushel by bushel basis. So I know a friend of mine raises, um, he runs 200 acres, his dad runs a few more, about 350, and he said it's a pittance. You know, it, it's it's around here in their budget, really. You know, it, it's not something that that's a make or break for them. It's it's a nice few dollars to you know go towards whatever equipment maintenance um, things for next year. But the much bigger things for the average farmer in the farm bill are crop insurance, um, the you know, some of the other money that goes into keeping the market kind of stable and upright. And I guess I didn't mention crop. Nobody's mentioned crop insurance before, um, but that's. That's definitely one of the biggest parts of the farm bill um, is obviously a government-backed insurance agency for the farmers because you know farming is a very risky business inherently. You put a seed in the ground and you hope that six months later it's going to be ready to harvest with some kind of yield um, to put money in your bank and food in your family's stomach and all that. So I think crop insurance is definitely one of those things that kind of it, it works efficiently and I think. For the most part, I, I know some people may have some other ideas about that, but it's definitely a, a major aspect of the farm bill for, for the average farm. I think going back to kind of my perspective earlier on climate change and with the, the new changes that farmers are going to have to deal with, I think crop insurance is especially important as well because we don't know what is going to happen in the next couple of years, like I guess that before with the magnitude and speed at which. Uh, global temperatures and precipitation are changing. Uh, crop insurance is a major measure as well. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but I was talking really fast, where because of the, the gridlock, um, the farmers who lost all the cattle in the early frost this year have not been paid for the huge loss of income. Um, and so that 
doesn't directly tie in, but goes back to uh, the economic consequences of the screw model. All right, so um, if you ask the question, you, and, you, and you aren't Ben Hutter because he already has one, then you can get a shirt back there. Uh, or a calendar. Or a calendar, yeah, one of the two. And then also, I, I, I realize there's some hands still up, but I think this is an important question to ask. Um, I, I just wanted, to, I wanted you guys to talk about like, what happens if we don't pass the farm bill? What happens if that doesn't happen? I think that's an important question to end on. I apologize to those who had their hands up, but I think we need to talk about it. Well, um, the Farm Bill expired September 30th of this year. It, it officially expired last year, September 30th, and it passed one year extension of the 2008 Farm Bill. So currently, we're, we're without a current Farm Bill. Now, most of the money, um, the Farm Bill doesn't allocate money. It sets the budget. It sets pretty much the upper limit, and then the allocations um, committees and what have you in, the, in Congress are responsible for actually writing the check. Um, which comes later. So most of the money for things like um, crop insurance, um, and now, the, like Katie mentioned, the cattle farmers haven't gotten paid because of the shutdown, so everything was backed up. I know there was a few, um, few things, a few checks that got, got missed for us for our CRP payments, things like that, while the government was shut down, that have now since gotten paid. Um, but, so the biggest thing that would happen if the farm bill wouldn't get passed for It'd be six months or a year, but prices would spike because it would go back to the control set in one of the original bills, like 1938, where it sets prices to some insane level. Basically, it's like the nuclear option or the, the whatever it's happened. A, it's called parity pricing. Parity, yeah. So they revert back to parity pricing. So basically, they like every nine bill. So the, the idea is the bill is particularly true in dairy. So you would revert prices back to, so for example, if a bushel of corn bought a pair of blue jeans in 1949, you'd have to raise the price of a bushel of corn to the price of a pair of blue jeans. Does that sort of make sense? If, you know, so it would go from, what's the price now? About 480. About 480 per bushel to 45 bucks a bushel. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of an extreme example. The most direct, the more, the most immediate effect would be on dairy. dairy. And that, yeah. that would go to about seven bucks a gallon. Or be, yeah, milk could go to about seven bucks a gallon. I don't know about hundred weight prices. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Edward has his hand up, and I, I, I apologize for cutting him off, but um, I do, I, if you have still got questions that you want to talk to these panelists and uh, talk to Weekly about, I bet they can stick around a little bit longer. I, mean, I don't know if they have they, they things to do, they have to feel free to head out. I'm sure some of these panelists can talk to you still, so feel free to stick around. Um, if that would be the only thing that you If you did have your hand up, though, and you were going to ask a good question, then, then help yourself do a calendar as well. I, I apologize for running. Thanks for coming, everyone.